order, we must move on to questions to the Minister for Employment and Learning. And I call Mr. Dominic Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Uh, question number one, Mr. Minister. Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I thank the member for the question. Uh, work is proceeding well on the implementation of projects flowing from the Higher Education Strategy, Graduating to Success, and the Widening Participation Strategy, Access to Success. Good overall progress has been made on those projects requiring early action, with a number of outcomes having already been achieved. The vast majority of other outcomes are, are unscheduled to be achieved within the target timescales. For those projects which have longer timeframes, project teams are in place and preliminary implementation work has commenced. Given the long period over which the outcomes flowing from the strategy span from 2013 to 2020, I am satisfied with the solid progress that has been made to date. In relation to the review of the maximum student number formula, my department will be commencing this review in early 2014. As members are aware, Mazen is currently used as a means of controlling student support costs and the block grant allocation to the higher education institutions. Therefore, my department will be reviewing the Mazen formula as an integral aspect of the higher education funding review. As outlined within Graduate into Success, I wish to ensure more flexibility for learners, an increase in part-time provision, and a focus on economically relevant activity through the funding of higher education. Mr. Bradley, for supplementary. Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his question, um, or for his answer, even. Uh, can I ask uh, the Minister um, what measures he intends to uh, put in place to ensure a more regional spread of student places across the sector? Uh, I thank the, the member for his, his question. And in responding, I would highlight the, the role that our further education colleges play. Uh, they are themselves providers of higher education. And in particular, we are keen to see a, an expansion of foundation degrees. Already, we have managed to facilitate some increases in terms of the full-time places available across the FE campuses uh, in Northern Ireland, and uh, certainly we have ambitious, ambitious plans uh, to do more. And often, it's that type of learning that is much more flexible and responsive to the needs uh, of the economy and businesses uh, in particular. Call Ms. Sandra Overend. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and uh, thank the Minister for his response. I wonder, uh, can the Minister uh, tell us how does the strategy now complement or does it duplicate the Success Through Skills Transforming Future strategy, which was launched last year, and the Further Education Means Business strategy, uh, in demonstrating the Department's integrated approach to providing skills, supporting people, and contributing to the creation of jobs? Well, thank the member for her question. Um, FE means business goes back uh, to 2004 and is something that we, I am intending uh, to commence a review in, in relation to uh, in, during 2014. Um, success through skills should be seen as the overarching document in relation to the activity of my department. And as such, it falls underneath both the programme for government and the economic strategy as uh, cross-cutting economic documents uh, at, at an executive level. Within the skills strategy, we have very clear targets for the upskilling of the workforce in Northern Ireland, both the current workforce and indeed the future workforce, and there's a focus on higher level skills and STEM subjects uh, within that. Around that, we have a number of different strategies that will support the skills strategy, and the higher education strategy is a clear example of that in relation to the promotion of much more economically relevant uh, offering uh, and increased investment in research uh, as, alongside greater number of PhDs, just to give a number of different examples. So all of the other strategies and actions that my department uh, takes have the skills strategy targets uh, very much in mind. And I also make reference to the forthcoming announcements in relation to apprenticeships, uh, which will provide an alternative pathway to the more traditional higher education route. But once again, that will be something that, that has very much in mind meeting the overarching objectives within the skills strategy. Well, Mr. Phil Flanagan. I thank the Minister for his answers. Um, as part of the, the higher education strategy and, and widening, widening participation, can the Minister give us an update on his plans for a rural university? Um, 
the member is referring to what is essentially Project 10 uh, within the higher education uh, strategy. Um, and we are in discussions with a number of different uh, providers in, in, in that regard. I'm sure the member could guess which ones uh, those would be, given the, the rural um, aspect of, of this particular project. What this is essentially is about is opening up access um, to people uh, to higher education uh, provision and having particularly in mind uh, those who may well experience barriers uh, and perhaps those who are work, uh, studying part-time and also trying to, to balance work, maybe those who are best placed to, to, put, uh, to, to take advantage of this. Discussions are, are, are ongoing and I would hope to make some announcements on the way forward within the next number of months. I'll call Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Would the Minister agree that higher education is essential to building a knowledge-based economy in Northern Ireland, where jobs have 25 per cent higher than the average wage income? And would he welcome the news that the knowledge economy in Northern Ireland is growing faster than the rest of the UK? Well, it's, it's very clear that the investments that are being made, not just by my department, but by the executive as a whole in this regard, are making real headway in transforming uh, our economy. We have had a clear focus in terms of building up um, our footprint in terms of the, the knowledge-based uh, aspects of, of the economy, and I'm glad to see progress has been made in that regard. We have still significant scope uh, for further development, uh, so Northern Ireland remains very much open for business in that regard. That said, we have to continue to invest in the supporting drivers that uh, will make uh, that a reality. That includes uh, investing in skills, both those who are coming through university as graduates uh, and also those who are coming through potentially higher level apprenticeships in the future. We also need to continue to invest in high quality research uh, of international standard. Um, our three local universities uh, already are well recognised for their co contributions in that regard. We have made a number of investments uh, over the past number of years uh, to grow the, the basic uh, research grant to the universities and also the Higher Education Innovation Fund. All of those will put our universities on a stronger footing. We also need to take much greater advantage of international networks. I'm pleased that we are part of the US-Ireland Research and Development Partnership. And we also have huge opportunities uh, flowing from Horizon 2020, which has just, just been confirmed in the past number of weeks, where we have over 70 billion euros available uh, through to 2020. And uh, we are determined to, to increase significantly Northern Ireland's drawdown from that fund. Call Mr Alistair Ross for a question. Question number two, please. Um, my department uh, launched a 16-week consultation on a review of employment law in July this year in order to fulfil a commitment in the Executive's economic strategy. The consultation, which closed on the 5th of November, elicited 41 responses. In the interest of obtaining as much evidence as possible, extensions have been given to a small number of stakeholders who did not meet the deadline. The responses received provide a significant amount of information and comment on the, the department's initial proposals. My officials are analysing the responses at present and are drafting the Department's response. This will outline the firm proposals for reform which I intend to bring forward and I plan to publish this response early in the new year. However, however many of the policy proposals will require primary or secondary legislation. I will therefore arrange for the Assembly Committee to be briefed on the outcomes of the consultation early in the new year. As soon as possible thereafter, I plan to present final policy proposals to the Executive. Call Mr. Ross for supplementary. Uh, thank the Minister for his answer. He knows that uh, this is something that I am very keen on saying, and it is very important for Northern Ireland to ensure that we maintain our economic competitiveness against uh, other regions in the UK, that we follow suit and, and reform our employment law. I am um, glad the Minister now has a, a date where uh, he thinks he will be able to bring proposals forward. Can I ask him, in his discussions with both the business sector and the unions, if he believes he will be able to bring forward proposals that will uh, meet with approval from both unions and business organisations? I thank the member for his question and, uh, again, to, to echo his comments about the importance of, of this review. Um, I very much view this, however, as being a Northern Ireland uh, solution uh, to fit our own particular circumstances, but one that very much has to take into account what is happening elsewhere, and uh, which has, takes into account the, the need for Northern Ireland to be competitive within the local economy. Good progress has been made in terms of discussions with the business sector and trade unions, and I'm particularly grateful uh, to the Labour uh, Relations Agency for sponsoring a roundtable forum in which those discussions are occurring. 
Um, I imagine that there will be a number of issues where a high degree of consensus can emerge. As a member will know, there will be some other issues where uh, finding consensus is going to be uh, more difficult. However, we still give that process a, a, a fair wind. Obviously, the more that we have a consensus um, within the key stakeholders in society, the easier it's going to be for both the executive and the assembly in turn uh, to take forward uh, the outcome of, of the review. In the event that's not forthcoming, we will still need to, to address the, 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 the issues and to, to find a, an agreed way forward. Call Mr. Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, in uh, considering reforms to the uh, employment law, uh, will the minister avoid a recommendation by Mr. Beecroft in his report uh, to uh, give the power to employ employers to sack underperforming staff? And would he agree with me uh, that uh, Vince Cable got it right whenever he said it was utter nonsense? Um, I can assure the member that uh, we have already ruled out uh, that uh, Beecroft uh, reform um, and it had, it did not form part of the employment law review that we took forward uh, in Northern Ireland. That was, uh, didn't, didn't, didn't meet the short list of things that we were going to consider uh, further. Um, not, not least for some of the, the reasons that the member has outlined uh, already. We didn't feel it, it was appropriate or something that uh, was going to find favour locally. Call Mr Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Has the Minister uh, received specific examples in terms of how many uh, jobs may be lost or indeed gained from trade unions and from employers if the changes that have been implemented elsewhere were to be implemented in full in Northern Ireland? Well, the, the Member does stress the importance uh, of an evidence base for reforms uh, that, that we take forward. Um, we are in continued discussion with both the business sector and uh, trade unions, and I, I certainly would encourage them uh, to back up a lot of the assertions they're making uh, with, with solid, solid evidence. Um, we do have the ability to also take into account how similar reforms have had an impact uh, in, other, in other jurisdictions. But I do want to stress the importance of trying to find a consensus around this, and also that a lot of public attention can be uh, directed towards some of the more headline or controversial reforms. But where I believe that the real difference can be made in Northern Ireland is through some of the, the real nuts and bolts of how the system actually works in practice. And, and through those, through things like greater use of alternative dispute uh, re resolution, uh, early neutral um, evaluation of, of cases, reform of the actual rules of tribunals themselves, I think that's where the real heart of how we're going to change the system is, is going to lie. And um, we, we are in a good place, uh, not just to almost follow what happens elsewhere, but actually to put in place Northern Ireland solutions that actually put us in the lead. Before calling Mr Pat Sheehan, I should have told you that questions 5, 9 and 10 have been withdrawn. Mr Sheehan. Am I going to ask Con Corda, case number 3, question 3. Uh, my department provides a comprehensive range of support for anyone unemployed or economically inactive who wishes to establish their own business. Uh, my department offers a number of practical routeways to self-employment that includes the European Social Fund and Steps to Work programmes. Some current ESF projects that promote self-employment include Exploring Enterprise and the Women into Business programmes and the Journey to Success project. Steps to Work provides support uh, ranging from basic awareness of self-employment and participation on Invest Northern Ireland's Regional Start programme through to the opportunity to avail of up to, up to 26 weeks support at self-employment where participants may retain their benefit entitlement while testing their business idea. My officials also work closely with InvestNI, which has a suite of programmes and advisory services available to potential and existing entrepreneurs in Northern Ireland. These include the Regional Start Initiative and programmes aimed at underrepresented groups such as female entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs, individuals not in education, employment and training, and those who are living in neighbourhood rural areas. The Apprenticeship NI programme is an employer-led provision with employers creating an apprenticeship position and recruiting suitable individuals as apprentices in line with future business needs. The apprentices are, are paid uh, from day one, working towards achieving an industry-approved level two or level three apprenticeship framework. Traditionally, apprentices in occupational areas such as construction have gone on to become self-employed or to establish their own business. In this way, apprentices have become employers and in, in turn have employed apprentices. Finally, as the member is aware, back in February we announced a review of my department's apprenticeship policy. Uh, this review will, is all encompassing in nature and progressing well and we will be reporting its findings shortly. 
Mr. Sheehan for a supplement. I'm going to go to Nara, Dr. Agra. Thank you, Minister, for his answer. I wonder, could he update us on any discussions he has had with the Minister for Education around the whole area of encouraging and cultivating entrepreneurship within schools? Um, I thank the member uh, for, for his question. It, it is something that um, both myself and John O'Dowd are acutely aware of. And the member will note that yesterday uh, we confirmed that we, it is our intention to take forward a major a review of careers jointly uh, during uh, 2014. And within that, one of the key themes is going to be to expose young people to a whole range of opportunities, and opportunities that are much more in line with the needs of the Northern Ireland economy. And that includes more and more people uh, starting their own business. Um, despite a number of strengths in our economy, we still don't have enough young people uh, considering the option of running a business. And the more we can um, spread uh, the message of the opportunities in that regard, the better we're, we're going to stand. So the member can be assured both departments are very much seized of that requirement. Mr Gregory Campbell. Thank, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister outlined a number of projects that, that are ongoing, but can he assure the House that where there are particularly young people who are uh, not in education, em employment or training, and have gone into apprenticeships, that his department, along with uh, Deddy, are actively targeting people who excel as uh, apprentices in order to start their own businesses. So it's not a case just of it being available, but they actively promote that. Um, I think probably where the real opportunity is going to lie to, to, to have that indi individual tailored approaches through the new uh, Steps to, su to Success programme, which will be the successor uh, to Steps to Work, where we're, we're taking people who are, in a sense, un unemployed as opposed to those who are in an, an apprenticeship and in in an employment um, pathway. Already, Steps to Work can provide support uh, to people setting up their own business. And some very good results have, have uh, become apparent in, in that regard. We're hoping to move to an even more flexible system under the, the new contracting uh, arrangements. And it's very much for, the, for the, the new contractors and subcontractors to work closely with those who are showing a flair uh, for uh, business and to invest particular uh, resources in them to make sure we're actually getting a, a productive result in that regard. We're, we're, we're trying to move away from trying to treat everyone the same, but rather working with their particular needs, uh, their particular um, aspirations and their particular aptitudes. Mr. Sean Rogers. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for your answers thus far. And following on from Mr. Campbell, in terms of um, young people, what, what percentage of young people who've, who completed an apprenticeship went on then to start their own business? Um, I am happy to try to provide those figures uh, for, for the, the member, but I think it's worth stressing that apprenticeships aren't per se a pathway to self-employment, though in many cases those who are apprentices will go on to set up their own business in due course and, as I mentioned, in the future employ other young people as apprentices. The apprenticeship is very much a way of actually providing employers with the staff, the quality staff that they require for their businesses to grow and to prosper. And we are very keen to reform the system that we have at present to make sure that we have a much more demand sensitive system uh, that uh, meets the needs of employers in, in that regard. But self-employment, no doubt, can be a spin-off of the system uh, that, that we'll be putting in place because those who have a good um, training um, will have the drive and the ambition to go on and to, 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 to be a success in their own right. I call Mr Paul Given for a question. Number four, Deputy Speaker. Um, I have introduced a comprehensive range of measures to address youth unemployment in Northern Ireland. The Youth Employment Scheme provides help to unemployed young people aged 18 to 24 to obtain work experience, to develop additional skills and to gain employment. To date, 1,038 young people have started the Work Experience Programme, 898 have started the Skills Development Programme and 689 have started employment under the Enhanced Employer Subsidy. The Steps to Work Programme also assists people to find and sustain employment. It is available to any person aged 18 or over, uh, or 16 in the case of lone parents who are not in work. In November of 2012, uh, First Start, a 26-week wage initiative for young people aged between 18 to 24 who are, were unemployed for six months or more, was introduced. First Start will provide supportive employment for 1,700 young people uh, before the start of the 2014-15 financial year. Almost 18,000 young people have entered employment uh, following participation on the Steps to Work, First Start and Youth Employment uh, Scheme programmes. 
Through the Training for Success programme, my department also offers a guaranteed training place for all unemployed 16 to 17 year olds who do not wish to, um, to remain in, who are not able to benefit from mainstream education or further education. The guarantee is extended for young people with a disability or from an in-care background up to the ages of 22 or 24, uh, respectively. Mr Given for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> Can I welcome the uh, efforts that are being taken by the Minister and this Executive to tackle this problem, but what uh, measures are being put in place to ensure that university degrees and uh, courses at our, our higher and further colleges are tailored to the needs of the economy so that people, once they're qualified, can get jobs uh, based upon the qualifications that they have? Well, I think the member touches on a, a, a broad strategic issue uh, facing not just our economy but a lot of uh, modern economies um, ar around the world. Um, undoubtedly, we all have a challenge to invest much more in, in higher level skills, and those who invest in higher level skills um, are, in the main, much more likely uh, to be in employment, to sustain employment and to have higher levels of wages or, or, or salaries. However, we do have issues regarding skills shortages and skills mismatches uh, within our economy, and often a, a general higher education or further education uh, qualification, um, particularly in the absence of work experience, uh, isn't enough to, to find and to sustain employment. That's why in, in the sh short run we're putting such an emphasis upon work experience, including for recent graduates, and also uh, some of our graduate uh, programmes such as, such as GAP, um, in order to um, address the needs of unemployed um, graduates. But again, I come back to the point around apprenticeships, and apprenticeships need to be seen not as being a secondary alternative to someone going to university, and in particular, a higher level apprenticeship could be seen as being a viable alternative choice for someone with good A-levels, but they will have the advantage of actually moving straight into a job, but reaching essentially the same point as a graduate uh, through having learned uh, on, on the job and, and earned a salary or, or wage in, in the process. So we are hoping to broaden the range of pathways that are are available to higher level skills and in that way we will see a reduction in uh, youth unemployment and it is worth noting that around Europe those societies that invest most in their apprenticeship and vocational training systems have the, the lower levels of youth unemployment. The same goes for those societies who place the greatest emphasis upon work experience. They also have the lowest levels of youth unemployment. Call Mr Robin Swan. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. A recent DETI report has shown that 63,000 young people between the ages of 18 and 24 have actually never had a job and were the worst region across the UK. When does the Minister think that his schemes and initiatives will actually start to result in jobs for these young people? Well, um, we are making good headways with what we, we have taken forward. I mean, first of all, it's worth stressing that our pathways to success strategy is emerging as an exemplar uh, within the, the, the European Union, um, in particular because we have placed such a heavy emphasis upon the community and voluntary sector and looking for localised solutions uh, to try to, to tackle the issue of those who are perhaps furthest uh, from, from the labour market. And it is worth stressing that our claimant count in terms of youth unemployment is, is, is falling, uh, notwithstanding the fact that the Labour Force Survey, given the small samples, uh, can uh, bounce up, up and down. It's also worth stressing that the performance uh, in terms of our youth employment scheme in Northern Ireland, even though we started it later, is significantly better than the performance of the, the youth contract uh, in, in the rest of, of the UK. And that does show the advantage of devolution in action, where we can shape the nature of schemes to suit our, our local uh, particular circumstances. So I do believe that while we're still in the early days of, of these, these schemes, we are making a real difference, and the, the emerging statistics would, would tend to back up that, uh, that supposition. Call Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Minister uh, partly answered the question that I was going to ask, and that is, how does our local schemes compare with uh, what is going on for young people across the water? Well, in terms of, of, of this, I mean, if you look at some of the, the, the published figures in relation uh, to, to the youth contract, at the end of May 2013, uh, against a target of 53,000 subsidised jobs per, per year, um, over a three-year period. Um, they have made payments to employers for just under 5,000 wage incentive jobs, representing a 9% uptick against uh, the target. In comparison, the Youth Employment Scheme, against a target of 2,500 uh, subsidised jobs, has secured 812 employment
employment opportunities, and 563 young people have started, uh, representing a 22.5% uptick against target. So, in terms of the early days of, of the, of the, of the programmes, we can see a market uh, difference between the figures uh, in Great Britain and the figures in Northern Ireland. Call Ms. Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be well aware that young people today are called the lost generation because of the high levels of youth unemployment here in the North. Uh, could the Minister uh, comment any further on the news today in relation to the apprenticeships at Harlington Wolf? We're having to fly in uh, uh, labour from elsewhere. And uh, the particular problem, you, you did say, Minister, in your response so far about Northern Ireland's solutions to problems as they emerge uh, around the £500 that, uh, that it seems to be the main stumbling block for young people to be able to continue in their apprenticeships? Well, the, the £500 issue is, is a red herring and is not the particular stumbling block in terms of, of this particular issue. What is happening with the Harlan Wolf jobs is that this is a, a very short term um, contract that was um, achieved at, at relatively short notice. We're talking uh, about 50 days for this contract uh, to be uh, fulfilled. So these are not long term uh, positions. Um, of the 600 opportunities, about 200 are, be, are being filled locally. For sure, I would like more of those uh, to, to be filled. The particular difficulty we have is that um, we can invest well in general skills, but for some of this work, uh, some very special skills are required. Um, we do need to work closely with employers and for employers to approach my department's skills solution service as early as they can for us to consider whether we can put in place some very bespoke training to turn people's good general skills into the specific skills that are required to take forward uh, this, this type of work. For us to go ahead and to speculatively train people in, in this regard would be putting uh, public funds at, at risk. So there is a need for us to be responsive to demand in, in the market and to get as much lead-in time as we, as we possibly can. But this particular particular case, uh, the, the, the transformation uh, time um, was, not, was not enough for Harlan Wolf to approach uh, my department for assistance in this regard. It's also worth stressing that we're not talking here about apprentices, we're talking about contractors coming in uh, to do a, sh a short piece of work. But it is worth again making the point that we do need to be making better longer term investments in terms of engineering skills, which is why the department and, and I chair a working group comprising of the colleges, universities and the business sector in order to make sure we're planning ahead effectively uh, for this particular sector of our economy, which is a dynamic uh, one uh, where there will be major opportunities on the way forward. Uh, Ms. Megan Fearon is not in her place. I call Mr. Colum Eastwood. Thank you, Mr. Deputy uh, Speaker. Question number seven, please. Um, I and my officials have discussed the expansion of the University of Ulster's McGee campus on various occasions in the past few years. The focus of those discussions was the one plan's interim target for an additional 1,000 undergraduate places by 2015. Within the resources available to me uh, for higher education, I have been able to allocate an additional 652 undergraduate places to the University of Ulster, which it has undertaken to locate at McGee. These will be in place by 2015. I will continue to bid for resources for additional education, higher education places for Northern Ireland, and I would hope to be able to move the university close to, if not to achieve, the interim target by 2015. I call Mr. Colm Eastwood for supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the, the Minister for his answer. Of course, I understand what he's talking about in terms of the, the interim target, but can I ask him about the actual target of 9,400 by 2020, which was in the one plan, the one plan that was uh, accepted and supported by the executive? Can I ask him if he is convinced that the executive supports that plan and that target, and if the university supports that plan and that target? Well, to be very clear, I mean, I. Um, would like to see the university uh, expand significantly in, in Derry in the northwest. I believe there's a hu huge opportunity and it will have a major impact on the economy if that was the case. Against that, we have to bear in mind that um, for the executive to resource that degree of an expansion uh, would re re uh, require a recurring investment of tens of millions of pounds uh, every year. 
and that has to be taken in the round against other aspects of higher education. And I would, would remind the House that already uh, Northern Ireland is, is having to fund the, the freeze of, of tuition fees, which is not something that's covered uh, within, within the block grant. So we need to, 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 to take those issues in the round. Of course, the university does have the, the ability to move places around uh, Northern Ireland uh, if it chooses uh, to, to do so. The, the position of the university is that they are happy to uh, put additional places that may well be allocated uh, to the university into the, the McGee campus. I would also highlight the, the potential for much greater attraction of international students uh, to, to the North West and to Northern Ireland as a whole. But no doubt, building upon the success of the, of the City of Culture, uh, Derry will be well placed in, in that regard. We do not necessarily need to see this expansion occurring purely in, in terms of full time expansion. So, both international students and part time students are not counted as part of MASM. So, that is another route through which, uh, in part, the 9,400 target could be met. Order. That ends the period for oral questions. We will now move on to topical questions, and I call Mrs. Brenda Heal. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I ask the Minister how valuable the Open University is to the NI economy in terms of upskilling? Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank the member for, for her question. Um, first of all, uh, we should formally welcome the Open University uh, to the local higher education family. Um, they are a very welcome uh, addition. Um, I believe they would bring a, a, a variety in terms of, of the offering that, that they make. Um, they have a good footprint in terms of research. They have um, one of the highest, uh, if not the highest, uh, student satisfaction ratings uh, in, in the United Kingdom. And as we move um, towards uh, promoting different types of, of learning uh, in terms of higher education, as we try to link up higher education with a revised form of, of apprenticeships, I believe that the Open University in particular will be, will be well placed uh, to, to take advantage of the changing policy environment and to provide a lot of solutions uh, for the, the local economy. Ms. Heal for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. And, and given that upskilling is of immense importance to the growth of our economy, how is your department engaging with the Sector Skills Council to attract and retain talent and skills for growth in our key industries? Again, I thank the member for her question. I mean, there are a range of sector skills councils uh, in Northern Ireland, I mean, eSkills, um, SEMTA. Um, this morning I was also with uh, Creative and Cultural Skills uh, at, the, at the Lyric Theatre for their launch of their uh, ambitious uh, plans to increase um, the, the number of jobs in that sector in, in Northern Ireland. So ongoing work and discussions with the sector skills councils is absolutely critical uh, to the future of, of, of the policy uh, development. And also, the more we can actually hear a collective voice from industry in relation to training and skills requirements, then the more efficient and effective uh, government is going to be. I call Mr Jimmy Spratt for a topical question. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. In light of last week's uh, joint university showcase in the Long Gallery, attended by many members uh, around this chamber, uh, how will the Minister uh, ensure that the higher education sector, which is vital uh, to the Northern Ireland economy, uh, continue to thrive? Well, I, I thank the member for his question. I, he was right to highlight the success of that uh, showcase last week, and I congratulate the, the committee for uh, facilitating that. Um, the university sector is going to be critical uh, for the future of, of the economy, um, and in particular, research and cutting edge, cutting edge international research will give us uh, that, that real. Uh, boost and impetus as we, we develop further in terms of the knowledge-based uh, economy. We have sought over the past number of years to make a number of strategic investments in the universities. So we, so we have increased the number of undergraduate places. We have increased the number of postgraduate awards. So we are now essentially facilitating a doubling of PhD opportunities that are supported by the state uh, over the course of, of, this, of this decade. We have also increased uh, research funding across a number of, of, di of different programmes. But it is worth stressing uh, to the member and, and, and the rest of the House that on the back of the decision to, to freeze tuition fees and a note this is something uh, that across political parties um, 
people are keen uh, to, to follow through with, including notably his, his own party. That, that means we are diverging from the, um, the, the, what's happening in the rest of the UK in terms of funding arrangements. So we have to fund, to fund that locally. Uh, to date, the executive has a financial package that has allowed us to maintain funding of the universities while freezing tuition fees. And as we move to the future, no doubt to continue to freeze tuition fees, it's important that we at the very least continue to resource our universities at the current level, if not to increase funding in a strategic way to allow them uh, to, to expand. What I want to avoid, and I'm sure everyone agrees with in this assembly, is that there's no point in freezing tuition fees and ending up in a situation that people can have to pay less but end up with a lesser product. We want people to pay less, to stay at home, to go to university, but to have the best education that they, that they can possibly have. Mr Spratt for supplementary. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Uh, what recommendations uh, for specific measures or actions uh, will the Minister bring to executive colleagues uh, to ensure that the commitments in, enshrined in last uh, week's all-party motion calling for continued support and investment in higher uh, education are met? Again, um, this is very much a, a, a partnership. It falls to, to my department to deliver the, the higher education strategy, which we have set out, which I do, does believe uh, gives us a, a good um, foundation on which to, to move forward. And, um, we have also made a number of different bids for, for resources. In turn, um, as, as the, for the executive, in particular the finance um, minister, uh, to, to look at the overall funding package that is available uh, to uh, the department and indeed uh, in due course uh, to the, uh, the universities. Mm -hmm. Members will be aware that um, we need to start considering uh, what happens in terms of the next budget round beyond um, March 2015, and discussions are already underway between departments as to how that uh, would look. And certainly, from my perspective, issues regarding uh, higher education funding are perhaps the, the key issue in, in those discussions. Well, Mrs. Dolores Kelly, for a topical question. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be aware of the University of Ulster's work and linkage with the Confucius Institute. And uh, in, in relation to exchanges between teachers and students uh, and how that could be funded, I, I realise some of it crosses uh, with the Department of Education. But uh, if this uh, region is actually to do business with China, there is actually a better promotion of the culture and ideas and relationships. So I just wonder uh, what representations, if any, have you received from the Confucius Institute or indeed colleges in relation to put, uh, actually implement some of their programme of work? Well, I thank the member for her question, and she indicates what is a, a major area of uh, potential expansion for um, our local um, higher education institutions. Um, the University of Ulster have been very proactive in terms of the establishment of the Confucius Institute uh, in, in Korean, um, and opportunities will flow from that in terms of. of both teachers and, and pupils at school. And this also reflects that universities aren't simply an issue for, for my department. They're something that, that are a resource available right across all aspects of life in Northern Ireland, never mind just in, ter in terms of, of government. There's going to be a showcase event in relation to this uh, on Friday in, in Parliament buildings, which will be another, another opportunity to discuss exactly how we can be of assistance uh, in this regard. But overall, I'm keen to promote uh, internationalisation. It's one of the key themes within the higher education strategy, and it works in two different ways. We want to be attracting more students from overseas to come to our institutions. We have a, a, low, a small footprint um, compared to other regions, it's, again, it's a legacy of the Troubles. Um, but equally, we want to ensure that as many of our own students have the opportunity as part of their studies to experience uh, other societies. And um, we, we run um, almost like a parallel programme to Study USA, which is Study China, which allows um, our own students to access opportunities in, in what is still a, a, a very different culture, but also a, a radically transforming and successful economy. Mrs Kelly for supplement. Uh, thank the Minister for uh, his answer. Uh, Minister, you mentioned a particular uh, foreign student. You know, I just wonder, in terms of their accommodation needs, what's your assessment analysis and actually in the provision of such accommodation? Well, b both are, uh, shall we say, campus-based uh, universities um, do uh, have fairly reasonable uh, footprints in terms of 
of accommodation. Um, in some ways, they are better placed than some uh, other universities elsewhere uh, in these islands. Obviously, there, there are issues in, in relation um, to that at present um, in and around the issue of, of, of the Holy Land uh, in, uh, in South Belfast, which is an issue for both Queen's, UU and also FE colleges, but also for society as a whole as well. It's not simply a, 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 an issue for the, for the institutions. One of the other key accommodation issues is around the relocation of the, the University of Ulster from Jordanstown uh, in, into Belfast uh, and what will be the, the housing implications that flow from that, including for international students. And discussions on, under the uh, aegis of um, Belfast City Council are uh, ongoing in, in that regard to ensure we are planning effectively for that. Now, Mr. Barry Michael Duff for a topical question. Uh, thank you, Goromay Ogutta. I'll ask Ken Corlea. Can I refer to the fact that the Minister yesterday announced a review of careers advice, career service, etc., uh, following yesterday's uh, debate sponsored by the Employment and Learning Committee? Um, but can I ask the Minister um, if he might look at, and his department might look at, ensuring that careers advisors are fully skilled up in the CAO system? as well as the UK system? Uh, I thank the member for his question. We, and we missed his contribution from the debate yesterday, I have to say, but um, it was much poorer for that. Um, <laughs> um, the, the member touches upon it, I mean, a, a key issue, which is more than just an, an issue of careers, but to, which is ensuring a, a, a natural flow of students on, on the island. This is not about us directing students either to Great Britain or to, to, to uh, the Republic of Ireland, but ensuring that um, they are fully informed of, of the choices. Um, we are not at present sending as many students uh, southwards that are coming from the south uh, to, to the north. So there is scope for an expansion in terms of student flows in both directions on the island of Ireland. But for that, that to, to happen, um, we do need to have proper information around uh, university admissions. But it's more than simply a case of the knowledge of how the CAO system works. There's also the issue about the, the recognition of, of qualifications, uh, which is an, an ongoing source of tension between the two jurisdictions. Michael Duff for supplementary. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister to perhaps enlarge on those tensions? Because uh, the issue of equivalence and how A levels are regarded by some universities down south does present a major obstacle to students who wish to go to university or third level institutions in the south. So, can the Minister perhaps enlarge on those tensions and, more importantly, how they might be resolved? Well, um, I thank the member for his supplementary. The, the, this is something that uh, John O'Dowd is leading on on behalf of my department and, and his department. I'm more than happy to, to support his efforts in, in this regard. My, my understanding of the issue is that uh, at a political level, um, there, there's no real resistance that uh, our counterpart, Rory Quinn, accepts the arguments that have been made. This is essentially an issue regarding the independence of the universities in terms of their admissions policy, and that's where the, the, the blockage cur currently lies, and efforts are, are ongoing uh, to, to try to remove that. Call Mr Ian McCrae for topical question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Would the Minister um, give an assessment of the Youth Employment Scheme in Northern um, Yes. Um, more than, more than happy to. It's something that has been uh, discussed uh, already uh, on, on their questions. Um, this is very much uh, designed to, to try to break this, this vicious circle where um, young people can't get a job without experience uh, and they can't get experience without a job, so they're essentially caught uh, in, the, in that uh, vicious circle. Um, if we don't intervene, there's a real risk of, of the lost generation emerging because we have invested in people's skills to a certain point at, at a general level. But unless they are able to apply those skills, uh, those skills will go rusty. And not, on, not only will the individual have uh, a longer period in terms of, of benefits, uh, but society will lose the, the, the benefit of their uh, contribution and, and, their, and their particular skills. So there are three different strands to, to the scheme in terms of uh, subsidised employment, work experience and a skills development um, piece. Uh, and uh, our uptake of all three is encouraging. And I'm particularly pleased at the level of support we've had from employers who have offered uh, places. And uh, employers really appreciate the importance uh, of investing in the future, not just of our companies, but the future of the economy as a whole. Call Mr McRae for supplementary. Uh, will the Minister agree that now more than ever, given the level of um, youth unemployment, that um, 
pro programmes like this uh, are certainly important. But would the Minister also accept that if, if give, there are um, flaws within, within that, that he's willing to um, address those, certainly to deal with, with that youth unemployment issue? Yeah, um, the member makes a very valid point, and it was for that reason that we had a post-implementation review over the course of the summer of the youth employment scheme uh, to make sure that it was uh, meeting um, the, the purposes set out uh, for it. And we, we made a number of adjustments uh, in, in relation to it on, on, the, on the back of, of, of that review. And certainly I am happy that performance has, has increased significantly uh, on, on the back of the changes that we, that we have made. But certainly um, that's something we have undertaken already and uh, we're more than happy to do again uh, as we continue to monitor this, this scheme as, as it rolls out. Call Mr. Peter Weir for a topical <coughs> question. Uh, yes, can I thank the, uh, can I ask the Minister uh, for an update on the potential financing of the uh, proposed Cirque Theatre in Bangor? Um, well, the issue is something that is um, contained within my own department's uh, capital uh, allocations. Um, so we have the, the, the headroom. Uh, in order to take, to take this forward. Um, a business case has been approved um, by myself and also approved by the Department of, of Finance uh, and uh, Personnel. So the monies contained are within my own capital um, all allocations. Uh, we don't need to bid to the executive for any additional resources. So um, subject um, to everything else being in place with the, the final stages of procurement, uh, everything is, should be set to go for early in the new year. Order time. Is up. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Peter. Uh, that concludes question time.